God knows all. God takes care of all. He loves us all. And He sees us all. I'm going to talk today about God, God sees you. He sees you. I'm amazed. I said it in Sunday school. I don't know, seven, eight billion people in the world. He sees us all. It doesn't matter where on this continent you are. You, uh, not just this continent, where on this planet you are, he sees you. When I mean he sees you, he knows you. He knows what you're going through. Matter of fact, uh, he loves you with an amazing, amazing, amazing love. Let's talk about this this morning. If you would, would you stand with us? In Mark chapter 2, we're going to be reading in verse number 13. Mark 2, verse number 13. Thank you for standing in honor of God's Word. This is what His Word has to say to us today. Then He went out again by the sea, and the multitude came to Him, and He taught them. And as He passed by, He saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And He said to him, His messages were a whole lot shorter than mine. Follow me. But He had a greater impact than my messages too. So he arose and followed him. And it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sin sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Hear these words. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repent. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Lord, sitting high and majestic upon the throne, God of love, always living in presence of grace, always willing to give mercy, seeing us as we are, seeing us in love, desiring your best for us. Lord, I'm grateful that this world doesn't depend upon me. I'm grateful that my life doesn't depend upon me. It's just simply a gift from you. So often we're blind to your presence and your work, your glory. But Lord, I pray today, let us see Jesus, because we know that you see us. So, my Father, my Savior Jesus, send the Spirit today, your Spirit, your love. May He uh, wrap us up in your love. May we have a chance to be removed from this world for this moment in time and just to be at your feet. Hear your best for us. And Lord, as you draw us, change us to your truth and your will and your way. We need it more than we know. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Have y'all ever heard this verse? For God so loved the world. The world. That's me. And by the way, that's you and about 8 billion others of us just all hanging out around this planet together. Hold on. For God, I love this word so. He didn't just love. He so loved us. He loved us with His best. He loved us with everything that is a part of the holiness of the Almighty God. He holds nothing back. You have His undivided attention today. He knows where you have been. He knows where you're headed. But He's fully engaged in everything that's going on in your life today. As a matter of fact, you've heard me say this many, many times before. Before you woke up this morning, God prayed for you individually, by name. I had someone this morning 
Barbara said, I pray for you two times a day. Can I say to you, thank you. But my Lord prays for me continuously. He's the only one who can. And I'm very grateful that he does. For God so loved. You know, when he created this world, you, you may not realize this, but he knew what he was doing. There's a lot of things when you look around at the world, you say, this place is messed up. That would have been a good time for an amen, right? And there's so many things that he desired that I don't have the understanding or the knowledge or, or any way to even explain why he gave us so many different countries, so many different types of people. Oh, you can say, well, it goes back to the Tower of Babylon. Okay, sure, that's understanding in my head, but once again, this was part of his plan. How many races? Why is it that some of y'all are tall? Some of y'all are bigger. What was it, Jared, that Rick said about you? Bigger? I guess he was saying you, if, if you can fit in that chair, I guess the rest of us can. Right? I don't know. <clears throat> uh, Charles, I don't know if he wants chairs or not. He says he has to play, have a place to put his Bible and his drink. I said, well, just don't take a bath and nobody will sit close to you in church. It'll be just fine. <laughs> we have a lot of differences, don't we? We have a lot of things that we believe that are differently than other people believe. We live in a world of conflict. It's always been this way. I mean, the first family, and I'm not talking about the one in the White House. I'm talking about Adam and Eve, right? The first family had a boy, their oldest, killed the second son. I call that conflict. I can just imagine the tears that Eve shed for both boys, for both boys' sake. Looking at them, but yet still loving. She loved Cain and Abel. And yet they are synonymous when you think of Cain and Abel. You think of conflict. We have conflict. There's so much hatred and so little understanding. There's so much division. So little unity. So little decency. But so much rudeness. So much division. So little patience. So much judging and so little listening. So many people taking sides. But so few that come together. And we also have so much loneliness. And so little of God's love. By the way, today we still have racism. And it may even be reverse racism. Social status still divides people today. We still and we will always have the haves and the have-nots. Jesus said you will have the poor with you always. Now, a lot of people in this world think they have the answer when they don't have a clue. We live seen with our eyes wide shut. We don't see anything at all. So many people feel invisible. So what do they do? They shout loudly. I guess it will always be this way. But the one thing that they need is they need the message of the love of the uniter. The one who can take anyone who will and make them part of the family of God. Where we will live, listen now, in unity and love, in peace and happiness, in joy and together forever 
and ever and ever. That is so foreign to us. When we think of, we, we can't think of a day where we see someone who doesn't have an argument or a disagreement and they just judge that person because they're not like them. And we're all that way. We're all that way. Um, God always brings the message. I knew what I was going to preach today for a little while. As I preached through the book of Mark. I went to the hospital this week. Sandra Dorsey's going to have surgery tomorrow. 6.40 in the morning. You can pray for her. She's going to have open heart surgery. Went to see her Friday evening. Might as well. We didn't have power at the house. How spoiled we are. One day without power. And I'm, I'm, I read almost a whole book. I told Doug I read it with a clicker in my hand. No, I didn't. But, you know, remote control. Y'all have one of those? I mean, it's just so, it fits in my hand so well, you know. Read a book and turn it with a clicker. I don't understand. Went in the hospital. I said, uh, Sandra's room. I know she's in Ronnie Green, that area up there. He said, second floor. I said, great. What room? Well, I can't tell you that. It's the protocol of these. You know, they can't tell you the room. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm thinking, I've been in here so many times, and they always tell me, preacher, he's in the, she's, she's in bed 14 or whatever. But this young buck was going to straighten me out in Jesus' name. And I didn't say anything nasty. But you know what I did that the Holy Spirit jumped up and down on me for? I was pleasant. I was kind. Looked at him. But when I was leaving, I went. That was unnecessary. That was Why in the world did I do that? It was really rude. If he saw me do it, he would have thought, he probably would have went to me too. <laughs> it's just kind of the way we do things, don't we? And listen, we do it without thinking. We do it without having any understanding because it simply and naturally flows from us and our ego and our pride and our desires that the world is not meeting. And we, if we're not careful, we will live in brokenness even if you have the uniter in your heart. Jesus, it says, here he had just gone from one place where all the people were following him, verse, chapter 1, verse 33, the whole city gathered together at the door. And, and, and it, it goes on to say, um, we never saw anything like this. And in chapter 2, verse 12, everywhere that he went, crowds gathered together. Chapter 2, verse 4, it, it, it's... People were drawn to him. So here it says in verse 13, he went out again by the sea. Not just because it was beautiful, but I like being on the seashore, seeing the mountains that are around. And the Sea of Galilee has mountains all around there. And you, you get to, it's just enjoyable to be out and walk like that. Maybe he needed a little time a, away. Maybe he had a little time to pray. But, but listen, everywhere that he went, the crowds followed him. They followed him. They came to him. But hear this, he also went to them. Sometimes in church, we're just waiting for people to come. We never invite them, but we're just waiting for them to show up. Now, hold on. I am good with you inviting people to church. That's a good thing, amen? You may say, well, I, I feel uncomfortable about telling them to tell them about Jesus. Invite them to church. I don't feel uncomfortable telling them about Jesus. If you don't want to share with them, bring them to me. I'll share with them Jesus. I don't have a problem with that. That is my heart's desire. But please understand this. Jesus wants us to bring people to Him, but He also went to them. There are people that aren't going to come here, but they need somebody to tell them about the Lord. Jesus knew it was His mission to teach them. That's what it says here. Then, then He went out again by the sea, and the multitudes came to Him, 
and he taught them. That's what it was about. To connect with the people so that they could connect with God. You're going to have to have something that ties us together. I know as a preacher, sometimes people can be put off with me just knowing that I'm a preacher. You've got to connect with people. You've got to let them know that, that you don't have horns. Or, you know, my, my head's getting more bald every day, so my horns are showing a little bit more than normal. But somehow you've got to let them know that you care. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. But sooner or later, you've got to show them the love that has changed you so that God's love can change them as well. God has not taken us out of this sinful, broken, divided world. He's put us in it to serve Him, to love others through Him. He taught them. He cared for them. And He taught them. But then it says in verse 14, as he passed by, listen, he saw Levi. He didn't just see people. He didn't just see a crowd. He didn't just see a multitude. The spotlight of God was lit up in Jesus' heart towards Matthew. Levi. He saw him. If you don't get anything else from what I say today, God sees you. He knows where you are. He knows what you need. He knows brokenness. And he can meet your need. He just wants you to know he wants to meet you. He wants to love you. He wants you to be blessed. He wants more for you than you even want for yourself. He sees you. He sees you. In a world where people think that they're invisible, God knows you. He loves you. He's reaching out to you, and He wants you to join Him. What did everyone else see? A tax collector. That meant he was synonymous with a sinner. Now, hold on. They see a person, but they don't know that person. They judge him. They, they think that they, they speculate. They think that they know him. They don't know what he's going through. All they do is see a person, and they don't like him because he works for the Romans. He, he, he works for Herod Antipas. Antipas. And, and, and because of that, they judge him. <coughs> they see him as an enemy. And they don't want to join him. They don't want to be around him whatsoever. But that's who Jesus saw through the eyes of love. I wonder how many people are known today simply by their job. Oh, you know, so-and-so, they work it down the hill. Or where they live or where they're from, what they look like. When I was a kid in church, we used to sing a song. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. But is that how we look at people today? Is that how we see people today? How quickly, listen, I don't, I'm not saying you're intending to do it, but you'll look at somebody and without thought, you'll sum them up and you will judge them. If you like what they do, bam, you get a star. If you just are rubbed the wrong way, Bam, you judge. By the way, who's the only one worthy to judge? The only one that's perfect. All the rest of us need to get it in check. Jesus saw him, not by his social status, not by how much money he had, not by how much money, he, where he got the money. By the way, we are never told anything about Matthew that says that he cheated. 
or stole. All we're told was he was a group of people who had the reputation of stealing and treating people badly. All that were, when you thought, Matthew the tax collector, you thought, oh, there's that great big sinner that Jesus saved. No more sinner than all the rest of us. We don't know. Even in that, we jump to the wrong conclusion and we're convinced. You know, Jesus jumps to the wrong conclusion for a lot of people. Abraham was 75 when God called him. He was 100 when his boy Isaac was born. 112 when he took Isaac up on top of that hill and laid him on the altar and trusted God enough to raise the knife to take his life because he knew that God would restore him. Jonah, God used a backslidden preacher. By the way, God still uses backslidden preachers. Gideon, smallest tribe. Moses, he stuttered. Joseph, hated by his brothers, sold into slavery, spent his years in jail. Jacob, who God changed his name to be from Jacob to Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. He was a scheming cheat. And by the way, his boys were as mean as could be. Daniel, the forgotten teenager. What about the 12 that he chose? By the way, Judas was one of those. Gave him an opportunity. The sons of thunder, James and John. Peter, speak first, think later. Matthew, a tax collector. Man alive. If we were going to choose a church staff the way Jesus chose the church staff, it would look quite... I mean, none of their resumes would have fit. Yet, they were the ones God chose. And He said to Matthew, the same way He said to all of them, follow Me. By the way, that's what He wants with us. The word means to be on the same road. I hope you hear this. Jesus does not want you walking ahead of Him. He does not want you walking beside Him. He wants you walking with Him. And as we walk down this road of life with our Lord, He will talk to us and He will listen to us. He will share and He lets us share. And we have this bond of love that the longer we know Him, the sweeter it goes, it grows. How blessed we are. How blessed Matthew was. You know what he did? He got up from the place of work, left it all behind, and he said, yes, Lord, and he became a follower of Christ. Nowhere in here does it say that Jesus said, now this is what I want you to do. I want you to do A, B, C, D, E, and if you do, then you can be my follower. He took him the way that he was and made him into what God wanted him to be. Amazing. That wonderful gospel of Matthew, the reflections with the amen of the Holy Spirit that we need to learn about even today. Know about it today. Now, verse 15. Now, what happened is he was dining in Levi's house. Now, it doesn't say here that, that, that Matthew uh, said, or Jesus said, Matthew, we're going to, your house today, you're going to cook for it. That's not what it says. I don't think Jesus was that presumptuous. Matthew said, Lord, I would be honored if you would come. You and your disciples would come and eat with me. He wanted his friends to know what he, who he had met and what that person meant to him. So they show up at Matthew's house. Now in that day, they, they, there was often rooms that would be like 20 foot wide and about 50 foot long. It would be a kind of a plaster wall. They would have indentions where they could put books and stuff like that, use it like shelves. But large groups could gather together. Well, look what it says. As he was dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners 
always sat or also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. Is there part of you that wants to go, uh uh-uh. He did what? Why? We want to ask God why. Can I tell you that his why is beyond my understanding? Sometimes I don't need to ask God all the whys. I just need to ask him to fill my heart with love and peace anyway. We'll understand it better in the by and by. We'll know. I I don't have this relationship with Jesus where he has to come down and share everything that he's doing with me for me to okay it. I don't get a veto. I just get an obedience to walk alongside. That's what the word means, follow me. So he's there and there's all these people there. People, uh, one writer, I was reading this, and one writer said, you know, Jesus didn't want to be there because he's a holy person. He didn't want to be around all that sinners. I couldn't think that person was more wrong. I think Jesus wanted to be there. You you, you get down on yourself and you judge yourself like, like I messed up. God, God doesn't want to be with me. Yes, he does. You're the reason he left heaven. He's not asking you to be perfect. He'll make you perfect, right? But as long as we're here, we're still born of the flesh. Paul said, the things that I don't want to do, those are the things that I do. The things that I should do that I do want to do, I don't do those. If Paul said that, wrote most of the New Testament, what does that say about us? Well. I want you to see three words that really came alive to me as I read over this again. The last three words of verse 15. He's in the house. All these sinners are there. It says that there were many. Look at the last three words. They followed him. Y'all good with that? He didn't just show up. He showed up with a reason and a purpose And all these tax collectors started getting right with God. All of these amazing, wonderful things began to happen. I would have been shouting for glory. I have a friend of mine. We were talking about the state of the church today. And and for some reason, we started saying, well, if we were to start a church, we would call it Black Sheep Baptist Church. Because Jesus always came after the black sheep, not the white pure one. Not the the one that was without spot or without blemish. He just wants a bunch of folks that are just sinners saved by grace. Right? You know, there are people, you may not know this, and you have a loving heart, I understand this, but you may not know this, but there are people who feel like that they're not worthy to come to this church. They're afraid that if they came into that church, they don't know anybody and they will be judged. I didn't say you felt that way. I said they felt that way. But what they need is the same thing that got us, a head-on collision with the Holy God. He will take you from where you are and make you ready and able to take you wherever he wants you to be. Now, you might get frustrated at God because God doesn't do what you want, when you want, how you want it, but that's okay. God still got best. And I've learned it better as the days go by. I love the casting crown song. We will praise him in the storm. That was a good word this past week when the storm went right over us. Where I live, the, the tornado went about uh, less than a half a mile from us, right? The hurricane, I mean, it went dead over us. Liam was worried because Jody was sleeping upstairs and she didn't want a tree to fall on the house and kill Jody. She wasn't worried about me, <laughs> but she was worried about her. I said, honey, what was that lesson you taught in children's church? It was either last week or the week before. And it was where Mark chapter 4, where Jesus was in the boat and the storm came up and he went to sleep. 
And the disciples went and shook him and woke him up and said, don't you care about us? We're about to die. And he said to them, O oh, ye of little faith. He said those words, peace be still. If it was me, I'd have rolled over and gone back to sleep. I thought if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. And I rolled over and went to sleep. One of the best sleeps I had this week. We had the windows open. The cool breeze was coming through. I heard a tree fall about 5 o'clock, but it wasn't mine. So amen, hallelujah, praise God. <laughs> Matter of fact, it was a dead tree. It means I didn't have to cut it. It's down now. I can get to it. Even in the storms, God blesses. You see this? They followed him. They saw he was different. And they wanted to be like him. Well, if I was going to start the Black Sheep Baptist Church, I would not want it to be <clears throat> the Haughty Holy Church. Y'all ever been to the Haughty Holy Church? I mean, things got to be a certain way, and they're the ones in charge. And uh, they, they almost... I, have you, I, I don't like those preachers that go, God... Right. I mean, you say God, but when they preach, they go, you know, Lord God. Where's that come from? It's like there's a holy heavenly language that they have to use when they're in the pulpit. I don't get that. Nobody shared that word with me. These haughty, holy people who had 16, 613 laws that they were going to uh, say that everybody had to follow, and they were part of the Pharisee poli police department, and they were going around writing tickets for everyone who didn't do things the way they, shot it, they thought it should be done. Well, they show up too at Levi's house. Look in verse 16. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating <gasps> with tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how, I think this is just, this is, the, this is the word of the haughty group. How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? How dare he? Because they didn't approve. <clears throat> Let me just get to it. Jesus knew it. He heard it. So he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I, I, I know that there are doctors that get frustrated because all these healthy people keep coming to them. Y'all know, know the ones I'm talking about? I'm not going to go to the doctor unless I have to. Matter of fact, I'm going to go to the doctor because my wife makes me. How many men can I make? Amen that. I'd rather stay home. They never tell me any good news. Oh, bless you. You're the healthiest person I've met today. If you feel like going to the doctor, you don't feel good. But if you are sick, aren't you glad that they're there to help you feel better? He said, look, I didn't come for all you self-righteous people who don't think you're sick. Even though Jesus knew that they were. They had a terminal illness called sin. But they didn't see that because they had self-righteousness. So they could judge. Y'all hear me? But they thought that they were good. This message is not for you today. This message is only for the sinners. If we could just get the sinners in the church, God's will could be done. I have a gift called sarcasm. I, I'll talk to the Lord about it when I get home to heaven. But there was a church that I was at, and I got a big stop sign. And I stood on the front steps of the church, and I said, stop. Only perfect people. Uh, no, I said, no, I said it backwards. I said, uh, no perfect people allowed inside. You know what we want inside the church? Imperfect people. The perfect people want to come and rule. They can straighten the world out. Just listen to them. They got an opinion. If we could just listen to their opinion. When I was in seminary, we'd sit around on the couch and we could solve all the world's problems. 
And then we forgot what the problem was 10 minutes later. We didn't even have a... But we had all the answers. You know, what we should be is a congregation of people saved by the grace of God and grateful. And grateful. Now, I know this church, and I know that you love people. And everyone that comes in that door, you're accepting to. I appreciate that. You want to show love. You want to show kindness. But I also know you're like the preacher. You can give looks, right? And you can be mad. And Satan always divides and conquers, and we let him. He always wants to break up relationships, and we let him. We don't lead with love. We lead with us. And it hurts. And it breaks. Now, we're going to still be in this broken world of division and strife until the day that we see Jesus. But Mark saying with the choir, the king is coming. And we need to be found faithful when he comes. We need to be like Jesus. We need to see people and care for people and teach them and share with them the love of God so that they can know God too. And we don't need to worry about all the other people who've got all the answers. We just need to serve the one who has all the answers. We need to join with Him. The only way you can tell is by, not if they're perfect. No, they're not. nobody's perfect. But just seeing the blessings of God flowing from their heart and their life. Until the end, Jesus saw brokenness. Until the end, his disciples even left him. People spat at him. After he was beating, oh, you said you could heal others, heal yourself. The last thing he saw. <laughs> out of all that ugliness that was around the cross, was a man who knew he was a sinner who said, remember me when you enter your paradise. And Jesus saw him. Not for what he had done, not for who he was, but for what God could make him. In this world of brokenness, God, give us eyes to see people the way you see people. God, fill our hearts with love in this broken world of strife. Let us be His hands. Let us be His feet and go. Let the church, the redeemed of the Lord, Say so. I don't know how long until Jesus comes. I don't know how long you've got. I don't know how long I've got. But the world tears things apart. You've got it pretty good. Had a dear friend of me call me yesterday morning. He said, I pray for my father-in-law. And I knew as soon as he said that, in the last few years, he's lost his wife. He lost a daughter. He lost a sister. He lost some other family members. It seems like everything's been just falling apart against him. He lives in Stanhatchee, Florida. Y'all remember when Debbie came through? Bam. But guess what happened this time? The house, gone. All of his buildings, gone. You know what he owns now? A concrete slab. in a fishing town. But none of those storms can take Jesus away. Could God have directed that storm around? Sure. But in the midst of the storm, the Lord was with him. God's got this, folks. It doesn't matter. God's got this. So what he wants a group of people to do, I hope you're hearing me, is to be different from the world. 
Let the world fight each other, not the church, not God's people. The world has a thousand distractions, but not us. We're about God's business. When we get to heaven, the one thing we will know, the one thing we will realize is that putting Jesus first is all that mattered. Don't be distracted. Don't get away from the call. There are a thousand good ministries out there. I'm, a, I'm for all of them. There's a thousand terrible things that are out there. I'm against them. But let's serve the Lord with gladness. This is the day. Let us and rejoice in it. Somebody's always trying to get me to side with them. I'm just trying to get everybody to side with, side with Jesus. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Preacher, you're just a cheerleader for Jesus. That's right. That's right. I'm grateful for His grace. It changed me. I'll never be the same. Can anybody give me an amen? It's not going to be perfect. But the one on the throne is. Let the church be the church. Let the people rejoice. For we've settled the question and we've made our choice. Let the anthems, let our worship ring out. Songs of victory, let them swell. For the church triumphant is alive and well.